on The Gadget Show. Otis and I go drag racing, gadget style. Hey. We face the daunting challenge of building a machine to try and win the British Power Tool Drag Racing Championships. Yes, that's right. Just how fast can a vehicle powered only by handheld power tools go? This bad boy is quick! John offers some seriously useful advice on how to cope with the frustration of calling customer services helplines. I'll be showing you our top five extremely useful websites. And Otis is testing waterproof camcorders in Dubai with the help of dolphins ah! and a very scary water slide. It's not me. Go away. I'm not doing it. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, in this week's show, Otis and I faced a very manly and brutish challenge involving power tools. That's right. We have to build a racing car. Now, I think you'll agree, it doesn't get much more manly or testosterone fueled than that, huh? Manly? Yeah. Is that why you wore the same shirt? Hmm? Are you questioning our manliness? Yeah. yeah. Let me tell you, right now, OK, there are several women, all right, more, that's more than one, tuning into The Gadget Show just to check out the two pieces of prime British beef stood beside you, <laughs> all right? <laughs> prime British... What? Absolutely. Choose your cut. T-bone or sirloin? Yeah. What about a shank? I, I love a bit of shank. Yeah. Why yeah. not? Huh? Silver side? How about uh, <laughs> filet? Yeah. Top side. Brisket. Huh? Brisket. Uh, or maybe maybe a beefcake. Yeah. Beefcake. Beef yeah. Cake. Yeah. Fairy cakes. Once again, we've been given very little information about the challenge. All we've been told was to meet outside a tool shop near the centre of Birmingham. OK, so we're here waiting for this challenge, Jason. It's raining. raining. It's normally a guy with an envelope. Yeah. Yeah. I say we give it one more minute okay. before... Uh, All right. ..before disappearing. You know, you know what we could do, instead yeah. of that? We could just read the poster that's behind us. <laughs> yeah? Jason, I your challenge is to build a brilliant power tool racer. That will be capable of blowing away the competition at the UK's number one power tool racing championship. But yes, we expect nothing less than the winner's trophy. Shall we uh, look for some power tools? Let's do it. Power Tool Drag Racing started in the States 20 years ago. There are two basic classes, small unmanned and the one we were planning on racing in, large piloted machines. The rules for both are simple. You can use any form of power as long as it comes from a handheld power tool. And on this show, we have an undistinguished history in power tool racing. Come on! Last year, we entered a leaf blower powered bike in the UK's biggest event, but sadly, it just didn't have the oomph to make it competitive. Oh, come on! In fact, it was rubbish, so we got rid of the presenter who built it, threw away the old machine, and resolved to do it properly this time. Oh, come on! OK, Otis, we can only use power tools for yes. this vehicle, and they need to be handheld. So take your pick. We simply didn't have a powerful enough engine last year, so choosing the right one for this project was going to be absolutely crucial to our success. And it wasn't easy, as the range of power tools available for today's DIY enthusiasts is mind-boggling. But in the end, most of them had to be dismissed because they were electric and they wouldn't give us the power we needed to win. So that left petrol-powered tools, of which chainsaws are by far the most powerful. The more grunt we could get from the engine to the back wheels and down onto the tarmac, the faster we would go. Oh, it's a found it. Check it out. Look at that bad boy. Hey? Now, mate, this is what you want. <laughs> this was just what we were looking for. At nine brake horsepower, the steel MS880 is one of the most powerful chainsaws you can buy. But we still had no idea of what type of chassis we would build or even how many chainsaws we'd need. So, we decided to take a look at last year's winner and runner-up, which are also powered by chainsaw engines. This is what we're talking about. It's mighty, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. So, so I'm sitting on the runner-up, which is a flat eight, and this beast won last year. This, okay. believe it or not, is a V12 because of the way that each <laughs> engine is configured. Incredible. Isn't I mean, it? so basically, you know, this is what we've got to achieve and then possibly improve on. Yeah. Which is going to be the tricky thing. Should we give him a bomb around the track? Good idea. This trike was seriously well engineered. Come on! It had eight, yes, eight meaty chainsaw engines that pumped out over 80 brake horsepower. This is incredible. Build it up. Yeah, this thing is built to go. On the downside, it was heavy. I mean, I'm 
working all the muscles in my shoulders and my arms. And took a while to get going. But once the power came in, it flew. If it wasn't for the fact that my jewels halfway up my stomach, it would actually have been a very comfortable ride. And you can feel the power that's just waiting to be unleashed. Fantastic! Considering this was last year's winner, it was a bit of a shed. But as soon as I got behind the wheel, I realised what it lacked in style, it certainly made up for in straight line speed. Very noisy, you get a huge sense of the power behind you. Although the handling was a bit dodgy. It doesn't like turning left. That's shocking. And maybe I should have checked the brakes before taking it out. The brakes aren't working. Um... With no brakes and no way to turn the engine off, I was in trouble. <laughs> Let me explain what's happening. Slight problem. The 12 engines that are powering Otis around this track don't have any means of being stopped. They're good for about an hour and a half on the amount of fuel we've put in them. He's got no brakes and therefore no way of stopping. I personally have voted to go for lunch, but these guys think it's fair to stop him. So we've erected these two bits of wood. With the cart's ground clearance being so low, all we needed to do to stop it was lift it off the floor by a few millimetres. Well, that was the plan. I think I'm being signalled to do something. <laughs> but in the end, Otis figured it out for himself and hit the grass. I made it stop! Yes! I made it stop! Ah, so, let's get this right then. You parked that. You didn't crash it into the verge. No, no, what I did, OK, is I performed an emergency stop. Because what you guys were throwing at me wasn't working. We were so, trying. We were there for you. So I ran up onto a grass verge, OK? It was but all the, planned. The, what we should take away from this, right, rather than his strategic stopping... Thank yeah, you. Um, ..is that we knew for this challenge that we were up against some serious competition, some very special engineering. It's amazing. That's right. These creations are capable of doing in excess of 40 miles an hour, powered only by chainsaws. Yeah, it's true. The boys were really up against it. What kind of vehicle would they go for? Would it be a monumental flop like last year's leaf-blowing <coughs> effort? <coughs> or could they power their way to glory? Trust me, you've got to stick around to find out. And it's also worth sticking around because straight after the break, John will be offering up some invaluable advice on how to get the best from the bane of every gadget lover's life, the dreaded customer service helpline. And Otis will be testing the latest waterproof camcorders in Dubai. There's fear, fish and some lovely dolphins. Oh. Welcome back. Now, I'd like to talk to you about the thorny topic of customer service. Time spent on the phone with a customer services operator is, I'm sure you'll agree, time we'd all rather spend doing something else. It can be costly, stressful and sometimes very frustrating. So, here are a few tips on how to make the whole experience as painless as possible. While we all love our technology services when they're working properly, there inevitably comes a time when things go awry, and despite a quick reboot or perusal of the frequently asked questions webpage, we are still none the wiser. It's then that the last resort becomes the only option, calling a dreaded customer service line. And we all know what it's like. You rustle around trying to find one of your old bills, you locate what looks like a frighteningly expensive number and dial it, only to spend ages navigating your way through various options. All of our operators are currently busy. To hold for another 30 minutes, press 1. To get through to another set of confusing options, press 2. To do this all over again, press 3. To get inexplicably cut off. A recent survey by one poll revealed that of the ten worst call centres in the UK, seven were operated by telecommunications companies so it's not surprising that we get frustrated when our tech goes wrong, especially if we have to pay through the nose to complain. When you consider that the average length of a call to a customer service line is a shocking 23 minutes, and that a typical 0871 or 0844 number from which the company takes a cut of the profits costs up to 55p a minute to call from your mobile, you're looking at a truly eye-watering £12.65 a complaint. In addition to cost, they found that people were most frustrated by complicated phone systems being passed from person to person and call centres located on foreign shores. But who are the worst offenders? 
In a recent U-Switch poll, Tiscally received the lowest customer service satisfaction rating amongst home phone customers. Sky came out top with a 64% satisfaction rating. But with just 11 percentage points between them and Tiscally, some disgruntlement with all the providers is clear. Tiscally were also found to offer poor customer service support to their broadband customers, but they weren't the worst offender among the big names. Surveys by U-Switch and Think Broadband both reserve that accolade for Orange, though again they were only a few satisfaction percentage points behind their nearest rivals, highlighting the general dissatisfaction with some of the major broadband providers. But what can we do about it? Well, I've been looking into how to beat bad customer service. First, before you pick up the phone in a fit of rage, take time to jot down what you actually want to say. It may sound simple, but most customer service advisors are working to a script when they're answering questions. And if you're clear and concise, you'll get help quicker. Secondly, if you want to reduce the amount of time spent navigating the maze of phone options, there are shortcuts available and a website that lists loads of them. I'm on GetHuman.com, where there's a list of companies and instructions on what buttons you need to press to get through to a human operator in quick time. Now, here's T-Mobile, there's the number to call, and if I press naught at each of the three first prompts, I should be able to get through to a real person. Let's try it. Press one. One zero. Hmm, well that seemed to work. Hmm, sounds like a rather useful website. Now, here's the big one. Don't resign yourself to the fact that a complaint call is going to cost you money as well as time. Because while the company's website might direct you to an expensive sounding 0844 or 0871 number, the fact is there's a standard geographical number that gets you through to the same place. And say no to 0870.com is a website that can help you find these cheaper alternative numbers. So instead of ringing Tiskily at at least 10 p a minute on this 0871 number here, I can use this geographical 01204 number and get it for free on my mobile minutes or on my landline deal. So now you've got the cheapest number to ring and tips on how to reach an operator. But what should you do once you're on the phone? Well, most importantly, you should always detach the individual call center operative from the offending company. That person didn't cause the service problem. So, stay civil, but at the same time, you should take a note of their name and direct number in case you need to get back to them or in case the problem persists. And if all else fails and you feel you're getting nowhere with your persistent complaints, then I have one last tip. Why not take it to the big boys? When the customer services advisors won't help, get in touch with their boss. And I'm not talking about their line manager or their area manager. No! Email the company's CEO. There are websites that can provide you with a list of the current email addresses for the bigwigs of all the best-known telecommunications companies. There's nothing like going straight to the top to make you feel your complaint's been heard. A brilliant piece. That was probably one of the most useful bits of television I've ever seen. I just want to go on those sites now and find out all those, uh, those local numbers. It's absolutely superb, superb. Yeah. Uh, but I've got something, hopefully, that's going to impress you too over there. Come and check it out. Right, so you know how gamers are often accused of just sitting around and gaming being a very sedentary exercise, yeah. you know? No longer, Susie. Sit yourself down and start pedalling. Um, I've got a slight heel issue. Not a problem. Just do that Wonder Woman thing when you click your fingers and you change. <sighs> oh, it didn't work. No, hang on a minute. What's going on here? <gasps> Thank goodness for that. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, it's called Game Size, Susie. Yeah. Sit yourself down. OK. OK, now you'll see. I've got a game up here on the Xbox 360, and as I press all these buttons, look, nothing happens. No. OK, however, if you start to pedal, please go for it. Do your best. Look, you can see the Xbox controller is connecting. Oh, yeah. I'll press the A key, and I'm back in the game. Isn't that great? So the idea is that you can't play unless you're exercising. So you play away. Yeah. Um, the device, the game of size device, uh, also doubles or triples uh, as a conventional exercise machine. So what you've got is a rowing machine, if you adjust it. Um, you've got the cycling device, and then you've got the kind of interactive uh, gaming element that you're, that you're practicing right now. Right. So if I stop, it stops? Yeah, if you stop, oh, yeah. you see the, the controller then becomes dysfunctional. Clever stuff, isn't it? Yeah, so I just get immersed in gaming and yeah. don't realise I'm exercising. Yeah, exactly, that's the concept. In fact, you do that now. Immerse yourself in gamer-orientated fitness uh, while I tell you guys about something completely different. 
uh, underwater camcorders. Now, if you're into your stills photography, you'll know that digital stills cameras uh, that you can use underwater have been around for quite a while, but camcorders have been slower to market. However, now there are several on the market, and we've chosen three of the best for Otis to test. To test them, I'm going to take them on holiday to the sort of place you'd need a waterproof camcorder. Taxi! A uh, Heathrow, please. I'm thinking somewhere hot, somewhere with really great light. And lots of different ways to test them in the water. Dubai? <laughs> Once I'd landed, I was straight in a car and heading for one of the most famous man-made islands in the world. Dubai's Palm Island. The Atlantis Aquaventure Water Park at the very end of the palm was the perfect place to put my three waterproof camcorders through their paces. First up is the Panasonic SW21. It's small and lightweight with a 2.7 inch screen and a 10 times optical zoom. It will only work at depths of up to two meters though, which isn't as deep as the other two camcorders I was testing. The Sanyo Exacti WH-1 is the cheapest of the three and it shoots in HD and it goes further underwater than the Panasonic, down to a depth of 3 meters. It has a whopping 30 times optical zoom but a slightly small 2.5 inch screen. The Canon HF-20 is an HD camcorder for which you can buy a dedicated underwater housing. But the whole underwater package will set you back around a grand. But that extra cash should offer better quality and does take you much deeper than the other two, down to 10 meters, where you can shoot full HD movies. It has a 15 times optical zoom and a neat 2.7 inch screen. Right, on to the important bit, testing. My first test was to find out how well the camcorders performed underwater and how easy they were to use. Kathy the Dolphin was a very enthusiastic subject for my filming and I started with the Panasonic. Well, it does come with uh, two record buttons, so you can record in the standard way there, or there's a record button just there, so you can record torchlight. Although there are two ways to record with this camera, it didn't make up for the clunky zoom, which I found very difficult to control. There's no gradual, slow movement at all. And the sunlight made it difficult to see the dolphins on the screen whilst dipping the camera in and out of the water. It's actually difficult to frame up the shot. I can't see what I'm doing. Mwah. Love you too. There we are. <laughs> the footage, however, was really good, with clear definition and realistic colours, but it is only standard def. On to the Sanyo. The Sanyo set up very nicely. All the controls are at your thumb tips there, very nice. Uh, you can fold the screen back so you can see what you're doing. The Sanyo felt good to hold and the zoom was much smoother than the Panasonic's, creeping in and out very gently. This camera's actually a bit weightier than the Panasonic, but obviously when you're doing stuff underwater, that doesn't matter so much. The 720p footage was pretty decent, although at times I felt the colours weren't as bright as they should have been. And so, onto the final camcorder, the Canon. Operating this camera is a cinch. The buttons are huge, everything is laid out before you, dead simply. The full HD footage produced by the Canon was far superior to the other two cameras. The images were well defined, crisp, and colourful. I am not floating. But I struggled to see my footage because of the cumbersome underwater housing, which stopped me twisting the screen. It was also a bit big to use with just one hand. So after a morning with the dolphins, the Sanya was in the lead. On to test two. This is the Leap of Faith, a 60-metre water slide. The 30-metre drop at the start is almost vertical, and as it levels out, you fly through a tank of sharks, finally getting spurted out a few seconds later, hoping all your body parts are still attached to each other. It's not me. Go away. I'm not doing it. Of course, this being the gadget show, it had been decided that it would be a great test of the camcorders if I tried to shoot myself whilst going down the slide. I didn't agree. You know what I'm like when it comes to falling. I hate it. But it wasn't long before Mo, our guide, got fed up with my whining. If I do it, will you do it after? Look, Mo, man. Look, come on, man. I'm serious. And embarrassingly, he then proceeded to empty the contents of his pockets and went down the slide fully clothed. Now, I had no choice but to put some faith in the leap of faith or go back to the Gadget Show studio looking like a big girl's blouse. 
First, I went down with the Panasonic. I was impressed by how well it dealt with the massive light changes and how colourful the footage was. Next, I headed down with my favourite so far, the Sanyo, but surprisingly, it didn't cope with the fast changes of light very well at all. Finally, the Canon. Again, it didn't cope well with the rapid light changes and the footage almost looked, dare I say it, washed out. It's horrible. So, it was the Panasonic that triumphed on the water slide. Even at standard depth, it dealt with changes of light and movement very well. For my final test, I headed well away from the water and to the highest balcony of our hotel. I wanted to see how well each camcorder performed out of the water by capturing the amazing view across the Palm Island. The Panasonic standard definition footage was very noisy and grainy, especially when I zoomed in. The Sanyo 720p HD footage was much more colourful and detailed with good contrast. But it was the Canon out of its underwater housing that produced the best quality footage of the three, thanks to its full HD capabilities. So, G ratings, and it's 3Gs for the Panasonic. It only films its standard def, and the clunky zoom really let it down. It's also 3Gs for the Canon in its housing. Although it produced the best footage, its underwater housing made it far too user unfriendly in the water park. And it's very pricey. And the Sanyo just scrapes 4Gs. It's by no means perfect, but of the three, it was the easiest to use, produced great footage, and is great value for money. Right, time for another short break now, but after that... I'll be showing you some incredibly useful websites that I bet you've never heard of. That looks good. And Otis and I continue our challenge to build a full-on, high-octane, power tool drag racer with some pretty impressive results. It's a monster! It's a monster! <laughs> back. Now it's time for this week's top five and for that I have been trawling the internet. The fact is there are so many different websites out there that often really good ones can get overlooked because nobody knows that they're there. So I've hunted down the top five websites that are really useful that you've probably never heard of. <laughs> With over 200 million websites available to look at, it's hard to keep track of what's new, innovative and useful. However, don't fear, because I've found five websites that I think are pretty useful that you've probably never heard of. At number five, youconvertit.com. Youconvertit.com is a website that allows you to convert documents, music and video to a different file format for free. So, no more of those irritating error messages when you're trying to watch a video. Just type in your email address, upload the file, and select the format you want to convert it to. And hey presto, it emails you a link to the new version. So, no more buying new software or spending ages installing new programs on your computer. Genius. In at number four is supercook.com. Supercook is a recipe search engine that finds you dishes that you can cook with just the food that you've got in your cupboards and left over in your fridge. Right, what have I got? Some eggs, garlic, half an onion, dried bit of parmesan cheese. Everybody's got that in their fridge, haven't they? Half a packet of bacon, some cream. Oh, don't go down there. Don't look there. <laughs> a little bit of alcohol. Then all you do is add your ingredients into the search box and Supercook brings up a list of recipes that you can cook using your random leftovers. Spaghetti carbonara. Hey, who'd have thought it? The more ingredients you can find around your cupboards, the better the recipe results will be. means you waste less food and therefore save money. Carbonara, anyone? Number three is Alternative2.net. Alternative2 is a sort of social networking site where its users suggest alternatives to expensive software for Mac, Windows and Linux operating systems. You just type in the software that you want to replace, in my case Photoshop, and it brings up a nice list of alternatives that are chosen and rated by users of the site. OK, so I'm going to give Photoline a go. Free trial, 30 days. Like it. At number two, it's jubilee.com. Let's say you've got a holiday weekend coming up and you're not flexible on dates and you really want to go away, but you absolutely have to go on those days. Where do you go? Well, log on to jubilee.com. Put your travel dates into the calendar and it brings up a list of what's happening in all the major destinations worldwide. 
So no more trudging around boring places with absolutely nothing going on. Check with Jubilee first and you might have one of the best travel experiences ever. <gasps> Orange throwing in Ivrea. That looks good. And the number one useful website that you've probably never heard of is Animoto.com. Now, Animoto is a site that produces your very own movie-like trailer using your own photos and videos. Really simple to use. All you have to do is upload the videos and photos that you want to have, and then you choose some music from a really extensive online library from the site. It does the rest for you. Animoto works by analysing your pics using cinematic artificial intelligence technology that apparently thinks like an actual director and editor and uses the same post-production skills and techniques that are used in television and film. The end result is very cool. Your very own video that you can upload straight away to your favourite social networking site, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all your mates can see it. Awesome. Love the website, Susie. Great. Like your number one choice, but I especially like the food site. Oh, I knew you'd like the It's just one. such a great, it's just a good use of the internet, isn't it? Although I suspect the result for me would always be the same. Omelette, omelette, omelette. <laughs> it's quite nice to have a little bit of inspiration, though, sometimes, Absolutely, isn't it? Because you're yeah. not cooking the same things all the time. OK, right. Now it's time to talk about this week's competition. Absolutely. And you must listen very, very carefully right now, because I suspect you're going to love what Susie is about to tell you. Yes, we're about to give you the chance to win six, yes, six... Gadget Show live tickets for next year. It's a brilliant idea, don't you think? It's the Gadget Show, except it's live. Yeah. Last year, Gadget Show Live was a massive success, and the feedback we got from those of you who came along was brilliant. But the show sold out weeks before it opened, so this year we've made it a whole lot bigger to try and ensure that every single one of you who wants to come along can. The Gadget Show Web TV team will be there posting hourly reports from the show. And of course, you mustn't forget the 4,000 seater Gadget Show Super Theatre, where you can come and see me, Jason, John, and Otis perform a very special version of the Gadget Show just for you. <laughs> Jason, ready with the wind? I've got the wind. Nothing new there then. We'd love to see as many of you as possible at the show. And so for more information, please log on to our website at 5.tv slash gadget show. So the show is from the 8th to the 11th of April next year. Fantastic. Which is the weekend just after Easter Bank Holiday. How do you know that? I'm just a big fan of bunnies and chocolate eggs. OK, so don't forget, though, you can win six tickets <laughs> plus six <laughs> VIP on. tickets to the Super Theatre. Bunny and... bone, bunny bone. Carry on. Yeah, and carry on. And a limo to pick you up from home, drive you there, and then drive you home again afterwards. I'm OK, I'm OK. But that's not it. We're also, in addition to that, offering you 50 separate gadgets, uh, which we think are enough gadgets to keep you in gadget heaven for a considerable amount of time. So, uh, hold on to your hats. Here's the list. Oh, oh! Too much pain! You could win the Sanyo Exacti waterproof camcorder that came top in Otis's test in Dubai, a 50-inch plasma TV, a 32-inch LCD TV, a 22-inch LCD TV, a high-def Blu-ray player, and 10 Blu-ray movies, a higher desktop gaming PC, and a Paramount gaming chair, a MacBook laptop, and a new 27-inch iMac, a Canon Pixmar MP630 printer, a Panasonic TZ7 compact digital camera, a Canon 5D digital SLR and lens, an iRiver MP3 player, a Wii, a Wii Fit, a DSi, a Microsoft Xbox 360, a PS3, a PSP Go, and a pile of games for all the consoles, a swap watch. A Panasonic HD camcorder, an Apple iPhone. An Arcos 5 personal media player, a 5.1 surround sound speaker system, a Sony reader, a Rovio mobile webcam, a bulletproof USB memory stick. And an SOG multi-tool. And a pair of Denon headphones, a Berghaus Bioflex rucksack, a Magimix Cuisine 5200 food processor, a Flip Video Ultra, and a Griffin Smart Talk Bluetooth headset. A Power 8 workshop, a Cannondale Bad Boy bike, a Cobb barbecue, a flat light, a Dyson ball vacuum, and a Blur power kite. It's a prize fund worth nearly 16 grand. And to be in with a chance of winning the lot, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Who won the two? 2009 Formula One Motor Racing World Championship. Was it A, Jensen Button, B, Lewis Hamilton, or C, Martin Brundle? To enter, call 0904 1616 or text A, B, or C to 63555. Or send your answer, name, and contact telephone number on the back of a postcard or sealed envelope to Gadget Show 15, PO Box 46556, London N1 0 WW. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary, and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, Go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday the 16th of November and two days later for postal entries. Of course, we'll show you the question again at the end of the show. Good luck. 
Right, now it's time to return to this week's challenge and hopefully you'll remember that Otis and Jason were challenged to build a racing car. A manly racing car. A manly racing car okay. powered only by handheld power tools. Yeah, we've done our research and I think it's fair to say that we decided that we were pretty much out of our depth. Especially after last year's comedy leaf blowing episode. <laughs> I mean, this time, seriously, uh. the pride of Gadget Show was at stake. We knew this challenge was going to be tough. Last year, we'd been destroyed. Not just beaten, but totally humiliated by an opposition that outclassed us in every way. So, we teamed up with Stuart Pilly, a man with over 15 years' experience of building one-off specials. First question, had we picked the right engine? Dang, <laughs> Stuart! So, three of these in a row, what do you reckon? That's some chopper. It is some chopper, isn't it? It is. Stuart, you're our chief engineer, in all seriousness. We chose this out, simply because of its power. Yeah, we wanted the biggest, and we were hoping maybe three or four of them on a go-kart chassis. Is this going to be possible? Well, you've got probably one of the most powerful chainsaws in the world, so you... Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Along with the chainsaws, we'd managed to get hold of a second-hand F1 kart frame. It was light, sturdy, and had the added advantage of coming with proper brakes, so there'd be no chance of not being able to stop this time. But fitting multiple large chainsaw engines in the space that was designed for one small cart engine took all of our combined engineering know-how. And even when they were in place, they were still giving us trouble. We've got a bit of a problem with the engines being so heavy in that there's so much weight on the, on the back of the vehicle uh, that it's going to be very unstable to drive. I mean, we're trying to get these engines as near to the back axle as we can, but they still hang over a little bit more than they would on a normal go-kart. So, one of the ideas that we've got is to weight the front something like this. This 10 kilogram steel bar, once mounted, would help counterbalance the weight of the chainsaws, allowing the steering and brakes to work much more efficiently. And while Jason was up front, I was busy round the back connecting the three separate engines that, instead of driving chainsaws, would be together driving our back wheels and could be controlled from a single pedal. I feel very confident about this, Otis. Yeah. I think as long as those engines perform as, as required, you know, we should have a very powerful vehicle. One of the big problems with using chainsaw engines is that they aren't designed to work over a wide rev range. They're designed to be either on idle or on full chat, which makes choosing the gearing a bit tricky. And one of the important things about our construction is going to be the gearing ratio here. If it's too tall, then we won't have enough pull away speed. If it's too small, we'll get away quickly, but we won't have a really good top end. We'll only be able to find out whether we've got it right once we get out on the test track. So, after two weeks of blood, sweat and tears... Close up on the wrist there, look, look. Our world-beating, triple-engined F1 cart was ready and looked awesome. It was time to test it. There she goes! Good luck! Go for it, man. Very excited! And as soon as we got our creation on the track, it was clear we created something a bit special. Oh, my gosh! This baby! This bad boy is quick! Oh, my lord! And it is so well balanced! It just drives like a normal go-kart, except it's a lot quicker. However, just when we thought it was going so well, it stalled. Oh, no, not again! And it stalled. OK, it's gone again. Oh, no! And it stalled. Jace, talk to me. All three engines cutting out says to me it's something to do with gearing. It appeared the chainsaw engine's lack of flexibility had caught us out. The clutches were just never designed to work over the wide rev range we were trying to make them cope with. And once they got hot, they failed. Welcome back. Now, as you'll remember, in this week's challenge, Jason and Otis built this beautiful little power tool racer. Thank you very much. It's a drag cart powered 
Well, by power tools. Look, we did our research, OK? Yeah. And we came up with a theory, OK? It's quite technical, so just bear with me on this one. We'd put three dirty great big chainsaw <laughs> engines on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like them? So massive that we had to weight the fronts, because <laughs> otherwise it would just weird the whole way down the track. The concept being, if we had enough power, we could go off the start as quickly as possible and hopefully pass the chequered flag in first place. That's right. So all that was left to do was to fire it down the track. <laughs> and oh. everybody oh. standing. Oh. I, think I've, I think I've done my funny bone again. The big day had finally arrived and racers had come from all over Britain to take part in the UK's number one power tool race. There was every type of vehicle imaginable from the sublime to the ridiculous. But we were ready because we knew our machine was quick and after a few late nights in the workshop, we believed we'd cracked the reliability problems that had dogged us in practice. Oh no, it's stalled again! To address some of the issues we had after first testing, we've uh, put as big a sprocket as we can um, on the rear axle here to give us a quicker takeoff speed off the line. In fact, if it was any bigger, it'd be dragging on the floor, yeah. wouldn't it? It's massive. I'm just adjusting the tick over uh, because we had such a problem with stalling, didn't we? I mean, we rarely had all three engines going at once in practice. That is not going to be the case now because I've turned each of them up to 3,300. We were confident that with more revs and a bigger gear ratio, we'd not only solved our stalling problem, but we'd leave the competition standing at the starting line. We're ready. Obviously, we had concerns about last year's winner and runner-up, but they weren't the only machines we would need to watch out for. There was a quick-looking chainsaw-engined bicycle and an awesome stretched mini moto. But the one we really feared was a lightweight twin-engined cart that had a very clever gearing setup. What's your strategy? Um, I think I'm going to leave that as a bit of a trade secret, actually. <sighs> Just I watch thought, me fly. I thought you were soft touch, you see, but you're not Ify. <laughs> Absolutely not. in the least not. bit. See Thank you on the you, track. You. Yeah, take yeah. care. Britain's ultimate power tool race was going to be a drag race, which meant coping with standing starts, 100 metres of dead straight tarmac and timing lights. Each racer would get three runs to achieve their best time, and then the top four machines would go through to the final. There are some serious machines here, though, to expect even to get in the top five. I think we're going to be, have to be going some. We won't win. OK, Jason, you get three runs, they're going to take your two fastest times, right. yeah? Foot down all the way, every time. Got it. All right? Now, we had intended to share the driving at this event, but after last year, we had to win. And the half a stone weight advantage I had over Otis could make all the difference. So he graciously allowed me to take the hot seat. I've got three engines in practice. They kept conking out. We've changed the gearing, changed the clutches, I don't know how many times. It's, an, it's a wonder that we're even here. There was so much riding on it. And the trouble was, it wasn't just down to us, it was also down to how fast everyone else was. The race started well. There were some very slow runners, and some you were just glad were off public roads. Even last year's winner was struggling. Sometimes you look at the machines and, and you have to ask, what were they thinking? But the chainsaw engine bicycle was quick, posting a time of 11.2 seconds. Although it wasn't as quick as us. It's absolutely incredible. After our very first run, we were in the lead with a stunning time of 10.9 seconds. But then the big boys and girls came out to play. The Mini Moto did 9.79. The trike, 9.62. That was really quick. And Fee in the twin-engine cart did an amazing 9.2 seconds. We were now fighting for our lives. We just had to hold on to fourth to guarantee a place in the final. What we're going to try and do is get the revs really high up on the brakes and try and catapult off a bit more. OK. And it worked. On the final run of qualifying, I was on fire. And a run of 10.8 seconds was enough to put us in the final. The gadget. Yeah! Hey! <laughs> Wicked! Cool. Along with the stretched mini moto, the trike, and the fastest of them all, Fee, in the uber quick twin engine cart. I tell you what, let's go a little bit slower from now on. No okay? But we still had nearly two seconds to make up if we were going to win. And then it struck me, like a blinding flash of light. 
We knew we had the power. It was just the weight that was holding us back. It was time to go on a crash diet. So basically, let's remove anything we don't need, right? That camera, yeah? That's gone. There's a stabilizing weight that helps me steer. Gone. Get rid of it, man. I want to be in my pants. I'm basically a, a skeleton with a massive engine on the back. We had just minutes to go before we had to be on the start line. Do we need? Do we actually need sound? Do we... This was going to be close. The opposition were already starting their runs. The Minimoto did 9.6. Everything that's not necessary, just chuck it, yeah? <laughs> the trike did nine seconds dead. And Fee did an unbelievable 8.9 seconds. This is it. This is our chance, man. This is it, the moment of truth. So it had all come down to this. To be sure of victory, we needed to go a whole two seconds faster than our best ever time. It was a tall order, but if there was one person who could do it, it was Jason. All right, let's give this some juice. He's ready for this. Come on, Jason! Even if he was just in his pants. I gave with everything I could, and my start was blindingly quick. But then... Oh, no! What's that? I pushed it too hard, and the right-hand engine had fallen to bits. You managed to get your fastest run. Fee had won, and we'd come a lowly fourth. But at least we still had our dignity. Cover me, yeah? Just about. That way. Go that way. Did you cut? Thank you, man. Oh, we're so close to that podium. Place. Fourth place, yeah? You did really well, though. The thing that struck me was just how creative this event was. I mean, really, these are machines that are used for other things, you know? Like, like axle grinding, down trees. chopping down trees. <laughs> and yet there there were three of them propelling us down the track. Yeah. And some of those designs, you're not going to see them in any other context. It was, I was, you know, really excited to be part of that event. And it was so much better than last year's results. So well. much better. And it's also worth bearing in mind that this is not our final challenge. You, there will be more. Oh, yeah, this is the gadget show, folks. <laughs> All right? And we take our challenges very seriously. We do. And you know what? There are four more challenges in next week's show. Yeah. So you'd better be watching. Don't miss it. Good night. See you. Yes, next time on The Gadget Show, there's four challenges, one for each of us. We gadget-loving presenter types take on the professionals at their own game and try to beat them using tech. Can tech help me scale the highest climbing wall in Britain faster than the British climbing champion? You've got to be kidding me. Can tech help me drive a Porsche GT2 around the track at Silverstone faster than Formula One champion Johnny Herbert? Nail it! Go, go, go! Can John use the latest consumer cameras to take better pics than pro photographer James Nader? Nobody said you couldn't have a moving shot. And can Otis cycle to the top of one of the most gruelling climbs on the British cycling circuit faster than pro cyclist Russell Downing? Is that all you got? Russ, eh? Come on, Let's have it! That's next week, but right now, before the credits roll, remember to enter this week's incredible competition. As well as all the tech you see flying across the screen right now, we're giving away six tickets to next year's Gadget Show live exhibition at the NEC in Birmingham between the 8th and 11th of April. It's an incredible prize fund worth nearly £16,000. And to be with a chance of winning it all, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Who won the 2009 Formula One Motor Racing World Championship? Was it A, Jensen Button, B, Lewis Hamilton, or C, Martin Brundle? To enter, call 0904 1616 or text A, B or C to 6355. Or send your answer, name and contact telephone number on the back of a postcard or sealed envelope to Gadget Show 15, PO Box 46556, London N1 0WW. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday the 16th of November and two days later for postal votes. Goodbye. Good luck. Good luck.